Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us this morning. Um, uh, hope people are able to see the slides. We'll, we'll share them as we go along. Um, we, we're, we, that's been Declan, Connor, and myself have, have done this presentation for, for a few years in the Founders Forum. And I've always found the Q&A a very fertile um, section of this. Um, the three of us are active to, to different degrees with the whole startup and scale up community. So we've, we've come across a number of, of, of situations um, in, in practice uh, in the past, and hopefully we can share some of that with you. I accept that the EIS system isn't perfect. Uh, but it still is a very important feature of a uh, fundraising environment for startup and scale up companies. And, and the focus on our presentation today is largely on tax based financing in Ireland, and, and we'll touch on the, on the UK to, to a slight extent as well. Um, if you flick on just uh, one or two slides there, Samantha, um, no, go on to that one, go on to the next one, if, go on to the one after that. If you look at it, like there's, there's different sources of capital depending on what stage of development you're at generally, you know, in terms of the early stage stuff, which would be founders, you know, friends and family, uh, you know, moving on to EI and a bit of seed capital angel investors, VCs, and so on and so forth. Um, and, and it depends really on what stage of the cycle that you're in as to the, the more appropriate type of fundraising uh, that, that's, um, that are the, the, the fundraising that's more appropriate to you. Purpose of the day's event is to give you a better appreciation of how EIS might be able to help you in terms of funding your, your operation or, 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 or scaling it up or whatever. Um, I'll hand over to Declan and Connor now to go through kind of the formal part of the presentation. We can, if you want, take questions as we go along and, and, and you know, time time permitting. And I know there's, there's a couple of questions uh, in the chat box that, that we'll, we'll, we can deal with um, at the end. But, you know, we're quite happy to take questions as we go along. It's generally more, more we find it more 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 valuable or whatever. And uh, I'll, I'll pick up just at the end on a couple of kind of sum, sum up points. So I'm going to pass on now to um, Declan. And if you can move Sam the slides on, just one, one, or one slide there. Oh, uh, morning, everybody. Uh, Declan Doe is my name. Just going to bring you through the um, the EIS legislation. Sam, do you mind, mind going through to the next slide, please? Yeah, th th this is the umbrella of the AI incentives. There's actually three pieces to this. The first one is the uh, EIS itself. And what that's all about is actually trying to secure investment from third party investors. The second one is a special subset of that, which is the SCI relief, which is about it trying to get uh, money in or investment from family members and the third one is about yourselves the founders of the business can you get a tax break for investing share capital in your company and that's that's called the sure relief the startup relief for entrepreneurs so there's an umbrella tree subset of reliefs that give give a tax break for investment and um, next slide please um, so as you as you said th th this is the the, the, the uh, typical um, investor life cycle and um, I'll talk about later, a company can raise up to 15 million under the EIS scheme in its lifetime, 5 million per annum. But the reality in terms of what we see in the ground is that th th this, these reliefs are really uh, availed of by companies in the proof of concept, the seed startup, the scale up stage. As they move towards maturity, they tend to kind of, wouldn't say turn their back on EIS relief, but start to have more conversations with, with kind of third party venture capital invest investors. So it kind of tends to off the table. So it's very much in the, in the early stage seed and start, start up that we'd see it. Although theoretically, there is enough wriggle room and capacity to actually take um, investments at a much higher level. It's the next slide, please. Um, so what's this all about? From, from the perspective of an investor, what they're doing is they're writing a check. And here's a simple example. They write a check for 100,000 to invest in share capital in the company. If on a cash flow basis, if they don't, if they don't get the tax relief, it costs them 100,000. If they do get the tax relief, they get a 40% rebate, subsidy, um, relief off the revenue commissioners. So it costs them only 60 net of tax. So, so that's really something that makes people's mouth water, to be honest with you, is that they really like the idea that effectively when you put money into a company and get a tax break, and at some time, at some, sometimes the, the actual making the investment itself is predicated on the availability of that tax break. So in terms of statistics, um, yeah, this, this is what, where we downloaded this from the Revenue Commissioner's website. You know, some of the headline features are that over the last number of years, the number of participants in the scheme have reduced from around two in the mid to 200s at one stage down to only 37 in 2018. I think that was to do with kind of structural issues that effectively the relief really wasn't working. 
Um, but I think it started to ramp up a little bit since then. Um, if you see, you know, a total of 48 million was invested, about 42,000 per investor. But we'd often see investors and subscribe for 5, 10, 15,000. Um, don't feel bad if you don't get an investor who doesn't write a check for at least 40,000. So ne next one. Um, so the back one, what, the, what this really involves is an investor writing a check to subscribe for new shares in a private company and hold those shares for a minimum period of four years. So it's kind of a hell of a thing to do to write a check to subscribe for shares in a private company compared in comparison to some of the other investment options people might have had over the years, including you know, buying property and things like that. Um, the company must exist for the purpose of carrying out relevant trading operations. So most trades qualify, not every trade, but most trades qualify. Um, the company must spend at least 30% of the amount raised before relief can be claimed by the investors. So if a company raises a million euro, then it needs to have spent um, 300,000 of that on, on, on a qualifying purpose, which means working capital, stock, debtors, equipment, things like that. And once, that is, once that's done, um, the company can actually go in and actually create tax certs to give to the investors. And, and Connor will talk about that in, in a while. The maximum investment limit for an investor is 250,000. And um, there's a kind of a subset of that where an investor can put in 500,000, but they need to hold their shares for um, seven years. As I said, you know, it's not that it, 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 the investors don't invest 250, but on average, we'd see 50, 30, 40, 50, 60,000. That's the average invest, investment that we'd see. The company can raise uh, 5 million um, in any 12 month period and is subject to a lifetime cap of 15. But I'll go back to the previous example that a lot of startups and scale ups do not need, need that kind of money. And um, so don't feel bad if you're not getting near those thresholds. It's very technical and includes an anti, a lot of anti avoidance provisions. The legislation itself in the, in the, in the Taxes Act is 45 pages long, and in the guidance notes, it's 98 pages. So it's very, very compli complicated and actually probably over, overly complicated. So, next, next slide. Um, so what is the um, conversation that, get, that you would have with investors? Um, I think you, need, you always need a business plan. And maybe as part of this um, program, you, you, you're talking about business plans. You're talking about raising money for investors. You do need to um, figure out how much is needed. And you need to have that articulated in the business plan. You need to understand who your target investors are. Are they yourself? Are your family members? Are they friends or third parties? Then there's, there's the question about the price per share and dilution. So, you know, you're looking to raise 500,000, how much of the company are you willing to give away in exchange for that? And that's kind of a bit like the, the Dragon's Den TV show. It's, you want to give away as little as possible to get as much as possible and, and, the, and the counterparties has, has, an, has the opposite view. You need to think about the class of shares that you're issuing. Um, it, it, the, the rules have been relaxed over recent years um, uh, and you can actually raise, uh, use redeemable shares, shares that have different rights in relation to dividends, assets and a winding up, etc. Um, you need to always think about, you know, arrangements for exit. Um, I, I think in a lot of scale ups, and, and Hugh might talk to this a little more, is that usually the investors are in kind of shoulder to shoulder with the founder. So there's no defined exit. There is an anticipation there has to be an exit at some stage, because I said in my last, in my, one of my earlier slides, someone put in 100,000, they got a tax break of 40, they're down 60. So they want to get their 60 back at minimum. So I think preparations for an exit should always be on the agenda and maybe maybe even articulated in a business plan and the key thing is that investors might ask you that i want you need to give me a tax certificate before i can claim the tax relief so how are you fixed in terms of issuing in due course those tax certificates to me so we, we, uh, connor will talk to that in a couple in a couple of minutes so next slide please um the issue with EIS and all these is there's actually eu state aid rules wrapping around it um because if you think about it when the government gives a tax break to investors to invest in private companies, that's a form of state aid. And there's a lot of rules to the road in relation to, uh, in, in relation to this that are set out in, in EU, in EU reg, reg, regulations. The first thing is that you need a business plan. Um, the, the second thing, and I might just go through this fairly quickly because I want to, I want to leave time for, for questions. Um, there are special rules for firms in difficulty. What, what that doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean that a company that, had, that went through an insolvency process, uh, for example, in a receivership and examinership that comes out of that can't raise EIS money. It's far more, it's, it's far more kind of serious than that. That's a, a company, that, a startup company that had an original capital of 100,000. If it has 
spent 60,000 and has a revenue reserve deficit of 60,000, then more than half its share capital has gone and therefore it's technically a, share, a firm in difficulty. There's a three year get, a, get out of jail card on this, however, that if your company's less than three years old, you, you can never be a, a firm in, in difficulty. Um, seven year rule is in relation to companies, um, you know, raising money after it's been in existence for more than seven years, it needs to go into a new geographical area or product to avail of that. The relief is only available to SMEs, but if you look at the SME definition, most companies are SMEs, less than 250 employees, turnover less than 50 million. Um, connected people, so general, the general rule is that, that family members cannot invest in your company, but we'll see later that there's a carve out on this. And then there's the self-certification process. What that means is that rather than the company writing to revenue and ask them to get the tax to issue the tax certs, the company does it itself. So it's kind of like a self-assessment system. That is great news in the terms of in terms of administrative administrative con convenience and, and simplicity. It's bad news in the sense, and this is a big stumbling point, is that if things go wrong, uh, the the tax clawback. So if, if the company technically doesn't qualify after it raises the money and issue the cert, then revenue can collect the money from not the investor, but from the, the company itself. So if you go back to my original example where there was 100,000 put in, the investor, the investor, not the company, got a tax relief of, of 40,000. If something goes wrong, that 40,000 will not be recovered from the investor, but from the company, plus interest, plus penalties, and a risk of a publication. In, in, in serious cases. So effectively, that's a very um, loaded kind of piece of administrative convenience that will co come in. That's something that we see quite a lot um, of concern from, in, in, from companies and also from you know, chair, people, chair people as well who are worried that effectively, we're, this is great news, we're raising this money, but what is the risk this tax cost or hot potato could come back and haunt us at a later stage. So I just wanted to talk to you very briefly about the investment cycle. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and I'm not too sure if you can see this, but but generally this is what we see companies, this is the kind of the roadmap we'd see for companies who are looking to raise EIS money. The first thing they do is they need to have a business plan. And um, they need to figure out whether it's, they need to raise EIS, not only now, but at some stage in the future. If they do, then it's critically important that the prospect of raising a follow-on investment is articulated in the original business plan. If it's not articulated in the original business plan, then the company should be able to raise the first tranche. But once it goes to raise the second tranche, it has a problem. And that problem has nothing to do with Irish legislation. That's EU state aid rules coming into play. So effectively what we do, we'd always say to people, when you're doing your business plan, just don't always, just don't, don't just think about now, talk, think about the future as well. Um, the, the initial fundraising, then the company needs to get a tax clearance cert, and then the company issues the shares. It spends 30% of the money raised on a qualifying purpose. Um, and once it does that, it can go into revenue, a revenue portal. And Connor will specifically talk about this to actually generate tax certs. Once the investors get the tax certs, then they can go off and claim the relief. And finally, what the company needs to do is monitor the stat its status as a qualifying company for four years after the money has raised. So it's not just worrying about your position at the point in time of raising the money or at the point in time of issuing the tax certs, which generally, you know, generally a company would raise money. It might take three, six months, months before they spend the 30 percent. So at that stage, they can go in and, and, and generate the, the tax certs. They can be given to uh, the investors in very swift order, but then the company will need to keep its qualifying status for the fall, for the next three and a half years in order for the relief to be retained. And um, people always next slide please. People always ask us what's a business plan. It doesn't need to be a glossy document, but it needs to articulate some of the comments or, or um, generally best practice would to would to deal with some of the comments uh, that we have one to nine on this on this list. So I won't go through this at the moment. One of the questions we always kind of get is, okay, I raised the money, I've issued the shares, I've spent 30% of my money, and I, I'm getting emails doing my head in from investors looking for their tax certs. How do I go about to, uh, getting my hands on the tax certs to give 
to the investor because that's currency for the investor. Once they have the tax certs, they can go and claim the tax relief. So what I'll do now is just hand over briefly to Connor because he's had experience in terms of how to actually apply for tax certs. Thanks, Declan. Yeah, so the, so the system for application would have changed, as Declan alluded to, to recently. And now, once 30% of the, the funds are spent on a qualifying purpose, a company has 60 days to submit a RICS return to revenue. Now, people can say, what, what does a RICS return look like and where do I access it? So to access it simply is off revenues website. So if you Google form RICS, you'll be able to go in and you'll be able to pull down the RICS return off revenues website. We've put in a, a snap there just so people, when they're pulling down this document, they can see it's the it's the correct document. But once once you've uh, populated the RICS return, you submit it via ROS. And what ROS does is it populates statements of qualification uh, for each investor. So if you move on to the next slide, please. And that's just kind of what, what a statement of qualification looks like. Now, when you've completed the RICS return, that comes out populated. And you give one of the statements of qualification to each investor and then it's on them to go and claim the relief um, through their Form 11. Uh, it's important that the, the RICS return is completed carefully because like Declan touched on previously, if there's an error and uh, it's an incorrect statement of qualification that's given to the company or to the investor, sorry, the company can be on the hook for penalties. So that's kind of more or less the process, part to pull down the Form RICS go through and complete it carefully, um, submit it on ROS, and then the statements of qualification are populated. And once you give them to the investor, the onus is on them kind of from there on in to go, to go and claim the relief themselves. But um, i pass back to Declan now. I'm going to go through the rest. Yeah, just the just next slide, please. I just want to touch on... Um, so, so that this what I've talked about up to now is where investors make a direct investment into the qualifying company or into your company. What what the legislation also caters for is investments by designated funds. So you might be aware that there's funds out in the market that raise money towards the end of each calendar year with a view to um, investing um, in, in in target companies. So what happens is that the investors put money into a designated fund like a pool. And then the fund goes and invests in the various companies. The benefit from an investor's point of view is they're getting um, diversification, um, but it generally involves more cost because there are more professional fees and obviously in running a, a, a fund. Um, investors can claim the relief when they put the money into the fund and not necessarily when the fund puts money into the companies. Um, in terms of discussion, if you were to dis have discussions with designated funds in terms of their target audience of, of investee companies, they like more effectively established companies and they like to drop bigger investments in, into it so if you take a fund that generates 10 million they probably like to find 10 investee companies to put a million each into and those companies should be quite mature or generally be quite mature and um, they, uh, but they might put money into certain start, start companies in the scale-up space okay next slide please and the one after please yeah this this is this is the the, the, the second subset as i said Family members are, so you take, for example, a, 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 a girl who sets up a company and her mother and father are looking to invest or a brother and sister or her grandparents are looking to invest. Under normal rules, they are, those people are connected to the founder and on that basis, um, they cannot get relief. However, this kind of creates a tap tax fiction, this particular um, scheme, a kind of a let's pretend so it says, like, let's pretend that your father isn't your father and therefore is a stranger. And on that basis, that kind of tax fiction allows this connected party rule to be dispelled with and allows the parent, grandparent, brother and sister to invest in the company. It's a carve out to allow associates to invest, which would otherwise be disqualified. Close relatives are now OK to invest. It only applies to micro companies. Now, a micro company is a company with less than 10 employees and turnover balance sheet of less than 2 million. But so lots of companies in the startup scale of space are micro companies uh, and can avail of this. It's capped out at 500,000, but 500,000 is generally quite a lot of money to see the business. Uh, and the same general rules apply in relation to um, the holding the shares, the, the, quali the, 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 the availability of the relief, the issue of statements of qualification that, that Connor went through. 
So it's very, very simple. Um, similar, I should say. Um, so if you don't mind going through the next two, to, to the next slide and slide, up to the slide after, please. Yeah, that's great. Th the last one I just want to talk about is sure relief, which is startup relief for entrepreneurs, often overlooked. We're, uh, this is about giving tax relief to investors, sorry, to founders for money that they put into their company by way of a share subscription. And picture this, take someone who's working for one of the big tech companies. They have been earning a lot of money generally um, uh, over the last number of years and um, paying a lot of marginal rate tax. And they go off and they set up their, a company. They leave P, the safety of PAY employment and become a founder of a company, an entrepreneur. Think about it in terms of their first year trading. And I'm sure you'll all be nodding your head on, on this one. The, the, the last thing people tend to do when they set, start a company, start to draw a wage or salary out of the business. So they've actually no income really or modest income to shelter in the year that they put money into the company. So effectively, the granting of tax relief that we talked about before in terms of in the tax year that the shares are allotted is not really of much value to founders. But what they would love to do is to say, could I put money into a company by way of subscription per share and pick one of the years in the previous six years to effectively set that investment against in order to generate a tax rebate? So you could have a situation where 2017 was a great year for someone in terms of their salaries, their bonuses, their option gains and all that. But they invest in 2021. What they can do is they can set that investment under this scheme against their 2017 income basically respray it and generate a tax refund. So if, they, if you talk about 100,000 again, they would get 40,000 back. So what they can do with that 40,000 is either they can keep it because it de-risks their investment or more likely than not replow it back into the company. So effectively what they do is for 100,000 with the tax braces, the break, they can put 140,000 of cash to work. So um, that, that's broadly how it works. In terms of slide we're on, we'd say it is, you know, the alternative of most people um, founders put money in by way of share cap, uh, loan capital and so they have nominal share capital but they might put money in by way of a loan the good news about a loan is it's very easy to get their money back out once cash flow permits with share capital it's more difficult because under the company's acts once sh share capital goes in it's very hard to reduce it and um, it is possible to it's just an interesting one for people who've already put money in by way of loan capital that there is a window period of 12 months whereby loan capital can be converted into shares. Generally, that doesn't qualify for relief um, under EIS or, or SCI. The investors cannot convert loan capital into share capital be, um, and get the relief, but for, for sure it is possible. And it does, does require a bit of housekeeping in terms of an, an auditor cert as well. So in, in summary um, for Ireland, um, uh, scheme works better um, post recent announcements. Um, it's good to have the statutory book and as widely used by start startups and scale-ups and it's a vital so source of um, funding. The legislation is very complicated. Actually, just before Christmas, they issued guidelines which go on to 98 pages. So that, that, that illustrates the complexity of it. But there is a consultation process starting. The minister in the speech uh, last budget said he wants to look at uh, EIIS to see if any enhancements can be made. And Hugh and I are on a call with the Irish Tax Institute yesterday to kind of kick that off. Simplicity and and clarity, I think, are the two themes coming out coming out in terms of what the, the community would like to see. Um, it's it's always a challenge to find investors, and um, particularly outside the friends and family uh, network. And we don't underestimate um, the, 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 that because they need to write a check to invest in a private company, which is which is um, which is really what this is all, all about. You need to plan for an ultimate uh, repayment. So uh, complete cost benefit analysis from the onset. So always make preparations to raise the money and articulate your plans, not only in terms of the business, but also in terms of potential exit. Just briefly to touch on, uh, if you don't mind, go to the next slide and the one after, please. That, sorry, that one's fine. Um, it always comes up, how, how does the UK scheme works? Well, they, they have two similar schemes. There's the EIS scheme, which gives tax relief. There's the SEIS scheme, which was, again, is targeted at micro investors. It gives tax relief at 50%, so it's 10% more than we get in Ireland. Again, there's a lifetime limit of only 150,000 for that, but it's used quite a lot. They have better rules in the UK in terms of capital gains tax um, on a, a gain that an investor would, might make in the future on the sale of the shares. Um, Irish companies have, have gone into the, have availed of the UK scheme by effectively entering the UK market by opening up a branch or an establishment in the, U, in the UK. 
So effectively, we've seen companies raise money in Ireland and potentially also raise money in the UK. Um, and the, the bottom one there is Brexit implications. As I talked about earlier, EU state aid rules are a bit of a pain in relation to the design of the Irish EIS scheme. It, it'll be interesting to see what happens over the next couple of years following Brexit and following the departure of um, EU state aid rule restrictions. Um, so that's really my sum up. I'm very happy to answer questions. I'm just going to hand over to Hugh maybe now and he'll just wrap up in terms of a few other general considerations. Okay, can, can you hear me, Emer? Yeah. yeah. Grand. Fine, sorry, the, the, the other tax considerations point I won't dwell on. There's, that's, there are other issues that, are, that typically are relevant to companies in the scaling up kind of mode. The, the two that I'd refer to specifically that tend to jump out or occur to me are the whole R&D credit uh, uh, system, because obviously if you're raising money, the likelihood is you're going to be expending it. A lot of it will probably be eligible for R&D credits. Uh, it's a very valuable incentive, and it's, it's one that companies tend to, to, to overlook a little bit. And the other one, uh, the very top there is the whole question of staff incentivization, where, whereby instead of paying recruiting people and paying them fairly high salaries that you might do some form of um, deal with them whereby you'll pay them a lower salary but give them some particip participation in the growth and value of the company whether it's by way of options or growth shares or something like that uh, but there, there are two that tend to tend to, to, to come up uh, fairly regularly or whatever you know and our contact details are at the back of the slide so if, if, if Emer and Samantha are circulating the slides you'll have contact details for us. Uh, Emer I, I've lost um, vis vis visibility on the question so I don't yeah, know. Yeah don't, don't worry I, I have them here Hugh so so, so thanks guys I, I might if it's okay move us on to, to Q&A because there's, there's some meaty questions coming up in chat. If anybody's got anything they want to add, if you've got a question that's popped up over the course of the, the, the guy's presentation, just fling it into chat and we'll try and get through them all. Fiona, you were first out of the blocks. <clears throat> well, because it's happening right at this minute and it's a little bit confusing because we raised with a with Spark crowdfunding, which has, you know, about 49 people behind a, a nominee company. And I would have thought the nominee company would have would have gone through them but it has to go through the individuals so that um i don't know who talked about the rich yes. return form helped clear that up so mm -hmm. it seems that all i need now is their pps numbers and yeah i think if, if you want to um i think the, the the basic point there is that all all that that nominee company is is doing is kind of acting as a front for, for that group of investors uh, or that community of investors or whatever and, and clearly uh, the the uh, like from a legal perspective the the nominee company is the legal owner of the shares and it will it will appear on the share register rather than the 49 individual people behind it but, but, but from a, a, an EIS perspective the relief needs to be claimed by each of the individual investors who effectively beneficially beneficially own the shares um, all, albeit that they're legally in the, in the name of the nominee company in their behalf, so it's it's it's, it's as if you, you were funding you're you're completing an application in respect of forty nine people, whereas in fact you only have one on your share register. Okay, so it's let's say forty nine ricked returns. You you'll have to uh, no no I think it's one rate return which would have details of the forty nine individuals on it on that okay and when you populate that to to Ros, it should generate forty nine statements of qualification um to be issued to the investors good, good. thank you does that answer your question Fiona yeah clearly. super thank you. um so Alan Barry you there Alan. You had a question about um, responsibilities post investment. You there, Alan? No, he's gone quiet. Okay, let's move on. Um, the Stephen, you had a question. Given that EIS is certified by the company and the tax relief is granted to an investor, the company becomes ineligible further down the line, the company becomes liable. Does this not result in a discount given to EIS investors that would not be granted to other shareholders? Do you want to expand on that? Yeah, it's just uh, probably from our own experience, we had a, a broad range of investors um, and EIS came up with one or two, um, but we declined to offer it. 
based on our, uh, I, could I could never really get over if the company self-certified and we had to underwrite the risk against revenue, why would we offer a discount to one shareholder over anyone else in the round? Yeah, I, I think it's, I'm, I'm just wondering, is it a, a discount at all? Because effectively the, the person still puts in the, the 100,000. So if you're pricing your shares at 100,000, it's kind of 100,000 for a non-EIA investor, it's 100,000. That's the cash inflow that the company gets. Obviously, if they're not an EIIS investor, um, you know, the, the company doesn't have this hot potato to worry about, which is this downstream payment or, or effectively liability. Um, so effectively, it's like a contingent liability that kind of comes onto your, it doesn't come onto your balance sheet, but effectively comes into the company. So effectively, if the company does anything wrong, then this liability could arise. Now, it's, it's funny, back in the old days whereby um, people would have invested in companies, more sophisticated people would have invested in companies and put in their 100,000. Uh, they might have done it through a formal subscription agreement in the past. And in that subscription agreement, there was generally some kind of warranty or, or indemnity that if anything happened, that they would look to get the money back either from the tax relief, either from the company or from the founder themselves. Um, so to a certain extent, you, you know, uh, things have evolved, but in the old days, there was always this risk on the company um, that either it's a direct cost to the company or else there was, could, be, could be some kind of warranty claim on the company. Um, I think where we see where we see this coming in um, is, you, you obviously sound in, in, a, in, a, in a very good position in the sense that a lot of the time we'd see that the investors would be reluctant to write the check unless the relief is made available and therefore the founder has no plan B to decline an investment. So effectively, you're, you're obviously in a very good and strong situation to be able to kind of have that kind of bin binary choice between one and the other. Yeah, and I just to close that point, like I know it's in the absence of, of any other relief, it's good, but it, it, I don't think it's a solution for startups in Ireland as a scheme. I think it's, it's quite complicated, bureaucratic, yeah. et cetera, and all those things. So I, I would look forward to reform, maybe, uh, as it's being that, reviewed. That's a whole year. morning's yeah. discussion, I think, in, yeah. in, in itself, um, yeah. Stephen. But, but, but I mean, I think we had this chat yesterday and, and I mean, the BES legislation went down to back to 1984 and it's, 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 about, it's as if this wisdom came, and this, this 1984 legislation is pretty much in the, in a lot of it's currently in the current legislation. Things have moved on. It's a bit like this wisdom came down from the mountains and passed on to the generations and it can never be touched. Mm -hmm. So I think what we're trying to say to, the, to, to our point is going to be forget about the past yeah, be conscious of what the current world looks like and try to design it in terms of what would be the case if, if we never had a predecessor and we were just kind of designing it from from starting scratch. with a blank sheet of paper what exactly. would it look like now yeah exactly. okay thanks for that answering the question okay. super thanks Stephen. um hugh uh yeah. cooney so do you want to give us a little bit of um yours is in relation to exits vcs and how that mixes up with um with eis yeah, so um, we've raised money from two of the designated funds and uh, they both have exit clauses where they want to try and get out um, after four years and and uh, Enterprise Ireland has also signed up to that. So all, all those investors then are kind of parried the sue. Um, mm -hmm. And as, as per your first slide, you know, maybe as we go along, um, the next round will be with a VC fund, which won't have this four-year rule, which is all based on the minimum time they have to spend it to, to stay in under the EIS legislation. So have you seen any companies raising VC money where there was a designated fund in and was there fighting over how uh, the, the ranking on exit happens at that kind of four-year time period? Yeah, I suppose the first question to ask is like, at the end of four years, you know what? Maybe, maybe we want. To, do you want to talk offline about this? But what? What? What is the deal with the fund in, in terms of if they put, for example, a million euro in, have they got some kind of convertible or redeemable share that is to be bought back after the four year period? And absent that, they were to, they will convert into ordinary shares. Is that the kind of deal? That's yeah. It, yeah. Yeah, and, and the company to redeem shares now, you need to have reserves in the company. So sometimes it's, it's difficult to actually do that. 
So uh, effectively, what you might have is a, is, a, is a pricing mechanism built into the, the fund's subscription agreement in terms of the formula, in terms of conversion. And if that's done from the, outs, from the onset, then that's what the legal agreement is. And then you, you kind of have to bat with that deck of cards when the, the, B, the BCs come in. And that might more... I'd say, more, I'd say the EIIS fund is more protected from the start because they have it written in stone, whereby the, the fund coming in will be more worried to understand what kind of conversion rights they have in the context of pricing their investment rather than the EIIS fund because they're kind of sitting, generally sitting pretty. Now, they've no liquidity, obviously, in terms of getting out, which the funds like to see because the funds want to put money into a company four years and a day afterwards, get the money back, give it back to the investor and move on to the next fund. You know, so that's their, that's their what mind. drives their agenda. So I, I suppose it, like I'd be curious to see if there was examples of companies who have raised VC money because unless there's some concessions made by the designated funds, you know, I'm worried I could actually be unfundable from a VC point of view because those designated funds sit so protected at that four year period. Um, and the VC might say, oh, we're, we're coming in. We want kind of this, the same sort of ranking and uh, the designated funds are unlikely to give that to them. So you're kind of, you're a little bit stuck by the, the, um, the nature of the, uh, the, the way the designated funds look to get out after four years. But I'll be delighted to hear of examples where no, actually it's, it's, it's worked well, where VC has come in after the designated funds. Yeah, yeah. Um, Hugh might be able to answer this, but we, we don't run, PwC, we don't run a designated fund for, for variety, variety of reasons. And actually, I haven't seen many of my clients in recent years being invest, uh, receiving designated fund investment um, for sometimes for that very reason is sometimes they're too seed, seedy to get the money. And if they, if they um, you know, uh, and they don't, to a certain extent, sometimes the costs are too too expensive in terms of fees for, for getting the EIS fund. So I have no direct experience on it, but I can see where the conundrum comes from because effectively the um, subscription agreement for the EIS fund will set down the rules of the road from the start. And I can see how that can be a bit of a problem for, like, obviously the, the new investor can come in and buy out the EIIS funds, but generally they don't like to put their money to work in that way. They want to see the money go into the company to spend. You know? And obviously you we're, we're assuming at this point that four years in, the company doesn't have the cash uh, yeah, um, to buy the designated fund out and then move on with the, the new round from the VC. Uh, Niall but, McAvoy, I see you were on there. You might just talk about just from the, the cohort of uh, HPSU companies. Have you guys seen evidence of, of what Hugh's concerned about. Um, morning, folks. Um, it's a very legitimate concern that Hugh has um, because uh, what uh, VCs are looking, what VCs are looking to achieve with their investment is, is is rarely consistent with other investors taking their money out unless they're cleaning up a cap table in a later stage where there's a, you know, where you've got a bit of a camel of a cap table. Early stage investors were happy to exit at a discount to the round. So yeah, it's a legitimate concern, Hugh, and I'd be more than happy to take it up offline uh, with you and we can talk to our investment services team and see um, what examples we have. But we've had, uh, we've had detailed and, uh, and at times robust negotiations with the two main um, EAAS fund operators in the market, BDO and BVP. And um, because you know, their, their investment uh, instruments uh, and their investment rationale and their investment exits and the, the way that the way they build the deal structure um, is often not consistent with uh, with other investors investing for investing for you know medium term growth and a medium term exit rounds, yeah. than, and it can get in the way as you know Hugh it can get in the way and that's your question does this get in the way so yeah look I'm happy to uh, happy to take it offline and uh, we can talk to Joe with Joe Borders is your DA isn't he and uh, and we get Joe to engage with the ISD team and see see what we can find. Okay, okay. thanks. Super, thanks, guys. Um, Justin Perry, I'm furiously trying to find you on my screen here in front of me. You had a question about the thirty percent qualification. Yeah, my <clears throat> excuse me, my my question I think is pretty straightforward. Like, what what qualifies as the thirty percent if you raise more than just EIS, I think in the question I said, if you raise 100K in EIS, but end up raising a million, 
say the other 900 from VCs or whatever, is the 30% 30K, i.e. 30% of the EIS, or is it 300 k 300 k 30% of your entire range? Yeah, it's 30%. Of, it's, it's good news. It's on the, it's on the 100,000. Um, cool. What Connor and I sometimes say to people is that maybe it's a good idea when you're raising money to have a separate bank account into which you put it and get that company to be a feeder account to pay wages and salaries and other costs so effectively mm -hmm. not only do you have it in a designated bank account but you have total traceability i think in the new guidance notes and i can i can look at this one but i think yeah. they might apply some kind of fifo basis so effectively whatever comes in they might be able to regard that the first money so if you, it goes into a pooled account that effectively they, they regard the um the 30 percent coming from the first the eis money first but i think our general advice is if it's possible to open up a separate bank account to feed wages and salaries it just takes the issue away okay okay cool. super okay. thanks declan that sounds like a, a practical um next question will shareholders be charged for income tax for the sweat equity shares received on a yearly basis okay so that's just I'm sorry i might just ask I'm, I'm sorry, you is sing, it you, yes. you sing? Hi. Yeah. Hi. Thanks hello, for the Anna. question. Do you want to just <laughs> maybe you. deepen the question a little bit for Declan? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, and our company just uh, uh, is going to uh, close the first round for the investment. <clears throat> and uh, at this stage, we received some advice from the tax about the sweat equities we allocated to our share point, uh, shareholders. And uh, so we need to pay the income tax for this. Uh, sweat equity shares and however um, the sweat equity shares we give to these shareholders is because they didn't take salaries or they take only 1000 euro per month for their salaries so this is really try to uh, give them these shares and when the company make profits and to get them um, rewards um, for the contribution for the long years. So just wondering, and before we make any profits or uh, before the company really <clears throat> can give any profits to the shareholders, shall we pay the income tax now? Because we only receive nearly no salaries from the company. And then now we have the shares, but we don't have money to pay those income tax Yes. Okay. So, uh, and, and Hugh and, and, and Connor can, can jump in here, but is this an issue whereby effectively you're giving people shares in exchange for salary? So have you given yeah. them the shares yet or? We give them already. Yeah. yeah. So, so effectively what you have is um, if you take the, if you take some of the big tech companies, for example, it's probably easier to rationalize that effectively someone could, could have a, a right to acquire shares um, for say $10, but the shares are quoted at 25 at mm -hmm. the time. So the only reason they got that opportunity is they were, they were employed people. So effectively the difference between the 10 and the 15 is effectively treated as salary or taxable income. And- The 10 and the 25 effect. That's sorry, the, 20, the, the 10 to 15 is to be liable to, yeah. you know, income tax yes. and they need to pay that over to the revenue commissioners in a private company. The, the, the question or the, how obvious it is the difference between market value of the shares and the amount that they pay for the shares is more problematic because you don't have a stock market to actually measure. You can apply various discounts, minority discounts various other things to bring down the valuation so effectively i would be looking at seeing how you can mitigate the exposure just through normal valuation rules one of the practical things we see in you know is that transaction evidence is good evidence to say how much shares are worth so if you do an eis fundraising value the shares at a number um, and employees get shares for free or sweat equity then effectively there's nearly a proof of a gap between the two so it, it requires careful management it's very case specific very happy to talk to you offline you. about it but i can understand how giving shares in close proximity to a fundraising can actually give rise to a to a tax issue i, I think added to that Declan, is there's two things there's added to it. one is that the um that that liability is a liability of the company i think 
um, you know, the company is, is obliged to account for for the tax on on any discount, let's call it, um, that the, the shares have uh, have been given at. And and secondly, um, just going back to the earlier comment about that the company doesn't have profits or reserves that that doesn't actually impact on that position that the liability if if there were, if there was a benefit provided to employees when you go through the the share evaluation process and you say they paid less than the shares were worth in whatever notional way you go about it uh, I think that there would still be a light there still unfortunately would be a liability there even though the company might mightn't uh, have generated any profits or mightn't have any reserves in its own right. Okay, I see. Thank you very much, Hugh. Thank you, Dakar. Okay. No problem. No problem. Um, Justin Perry had a question here about uh, what your business plan says at the start and what you end up doing and whether that qualifies you, disqualifies you. I'll leave that one to Declan. Yeah, I mean, this is, um, this is in, the in the eye of the beholder because ultimately, you know, I, I, I don't think any business plan ever follows the yellow brick road that it's, it, 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 it articulates from the start. I think what you need to do is your initial business plan. All you need to do is have a business plan for your first investment. And to a certain extent, I think that is a statutory requirement. And whether you follow that verbatim, I don't think is necessarily the case. It, it, it problematic as long as you don't move into totally different markets and products and things like that. Where we see it coming up is the follow on investment. So the, the follow on investment should have been for, foreseen in the original business plan. What we have seen, just giving you an example where things look a bit gammy in that respect, to use vernacular, um, Connor and I would have seen someone prepare a draft business plan where they articulate the need to raise more EIS funding in two years' time. When you look at the cash flow, they were looking to raise, say, a million euro. When you look at the cash flows in the business plan, the company had, um, uh, you know, several hundred thousand in the bank at the time they're raising the second fund rate that it's found the money. And on that basis, it wasn't credible that the company needed to raise an extra million. They just stuffed it in because effectively that they knew it was a requirement. So your business plan should tell some kind of credible story that your future fundraising, which should show a need for money coming through and the cash flows um, at a later stage in time. If things are deferred by a few months or a few, you know, by an amount, it's no major deal. Revenue have detailed guidance notes on there, uh, and we can share them, the, the newly issued ones on that particular point. But I think it's a best foot forward approach. If you do not put it this way, if you do not articulate in the original business plan that a follow on investment, you're you're not going to get the relief. So you're, you're, out, you're off the pitch completely. So as a protective measure, at least um, insert probably a, a follow on investment requirement is probably the prudent thing to do using as as best um, estimate as you can at that particular point in time. And, subs and subsequent stuff as well, Declan. I mean, that's the danger with this thing. If, if you're very economic in terms of your aspirations, in terms of future fundraising, uh, it'll, it'll come back to bite you if you want to do a, a, a future EIS fundraising, you know. Yeah. So it's kind of, it's, it's, a, it's a hard one to, it's a hard one to answer perfectly, but but you nearly need to, to anticipate as much money as you think you will have to fundraise, you know. Yeah. And we've seen situations where revenue, where guys say, well, I'm raising a million now and the, the lifetime limit is 14 million. So I'm going to say in three years time, I'm going to raise 14 million and therefore everything is fine. <laughs> that, that, that actually doesn't work and that you lose kind of credibility on that as well. So bright, bright sparks have actually thought of that idea, but again, it, it is problematic. It, it the, the revenue guidance notes probably include several pages on this particular point. So I think there's some decent reading on that. Justin, and does I, that answer your question? It, it does to an extent. Like in our business plan, we did include a, a Series A round, which was a, a reasonable figure. Um, but basically, what what we've done is we were raising a seed round, and we were oversubscribed um, at that. And I think it was Stephen asked a question previously, which I was like, oh, because we raised more than we had originally put in our business plan for our seed round. Does, does that make us ineligible? Like it's not substantially more. It was you know um, probably 20 percent extra yeah can we come back to you on that one because i just wanted to see what's in what's in the in, in the guidance notes um there is there is reference that effectively if you do raise more than you you anticipated there, there might be an issue i'm not too sure whether that's on the follow-on investment side or on the initial set side okay. hopefully it's only on the follow-on side and um, but yeah we probably just need to dig out the, the guidance notes and have a look at that you know okay. that'd be great thanks Stephen.